Hi everybody, my name is Brad Rawson. I'm a Somerville resident and I work in Mayor Curtitoni's Community Development Office. We are here at an important juncture in the Somerville by Design neighborhood planning process for the future of Somer one of Somerville's greatest neighborhoods, Union Square. Can I have a quick show of hands? It's helpful for us to get a sense of who is new to the process and who has been participating since we started back in December or even beyond December. So can I have a quick show of hands? Who, who's meeting, uh, who's, who's here for the first time with us tonight? All right, welcome, welcome. And uh, I do see many familiar faces, so thanks to all of you who have been coming back faithfully night after night, week after week, month after month, to advocate for the future of this great neighborhood and this great city. Um, I'd like to all recognize Ward 3 Alderman Bob McWaters, who's here with us tonight. Um, he's pulling double duty. There's a snow ordinance hearing for the Board of Aldermen up at City Hall tonight. Alderman from Ward 2, Mary Ann Houston, is up there at City Hall, but sends her regards. We are about halfway through an important seven-meeting series, and we're getting ready for a really fun part of the process, which is our three-day design charrette. This is the sixth neighborhood where the Somerville by Design methodology has been used in the last three years. Um, and it's really, really fun for us because we have a series of these big picture meetings. We try to make sure there's an opportunity for factual dialogue so that folks in the community can tell the city's planning office about the things they observe in the neighborhoods, as well as we can share with you uh, certain technical information that you always ask for, right? Um, and we are lucky to have a whole team of uh, consultants from the city's side, led by Russ Preston from the principal group. Um, and of course, our development partners from US2, Greg Karczewski and his team are here with us tonight as well. This is the fourth in our weekly series. Um, we've got charrette schedules that are passed out. Um, if you have more specific questions, uh, please feel free to find me. Other, otherwise, the one-stop shopping for information on the internet is www.somervillebydesign.com. So Russ Preston will uh, introduce the process. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Brad. Hi, uh, I'm Russ Preston, again with Principal Group. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to uh, go through our sort of our schedule. It looks like a lot of folks have been here before, so this is not going to be new for you. But uh, it's worth pointing out that this is sort of the end of our um, our sort of visioning dialogue stage. And we, our, our next phase of work starts in March, which is going to be our, our design charrette. Um, you'll see that there are posters on each table and up at the front desk. Uh, we just released this schedule for the charrette. Uh, I think today. Uh, so please mark your calendars and, and make sure you've got um, you've got those individual meetings. Uh, if you can if you can't make one of those meetings and you still want to come talk about that topic, uh, we're going to be in the space all three days. So stop in anytime you want. You know during those open hours, and we'll be happy to talk to you about anything you'd like regarding the neighborhood. Uh, but well. Those blue, those blue squares, those specific meetings are about those topics and they're going to be very focused on design, policy, and all the, you know, sort of getting into the dialogue about how to solve some of these big vision ideas that we've had the last few, uh, the last few months. And then everyone should show up on Wednesday night uh, for the pinup presentation that happened in here as well, where every idea that we've come up with design-wise, policy-wise will be presented. Uh, so please make note of those dates. Um, so just, just to sort of orient everyone again, you know, this is our study area. Uh, so if you see folks that are in the study area that haven't been participating in the charrette, please let them know. Uh, they, should, they, should, they should get involved. Um, now tonight we're, is a really exciting part of the process. You know, because of the new train station, you know, with the Green Line opening here in, the, you know, in just a few years, it's really important that these buildings that happen right adjacent to the, to the station um, happen quickly and happen in line with that with that uh, opening of the station. So that's a you know that's really critical for tonight's discussion. But related to that is the idea of how does this zoning, how does the you know all of these zones correlate to what happens in the neighborhood? So I wanted to just as an intro primer for tonight's discussion talk about building types. So if folks look at the the new zoning code, you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of pictures in it, which is you know is not you know usually zoning codes you'll see around Massachusetts don't have a lot of pictures. But what Somerville's done is actually gone through the city and, and understood the natural patterns of buildings. And you can go through and see at the neighborhood scale, you know, the triple decker, all of the great buildings we love in the neighborhood streets of the city, all the way on up to the more dense building types. 
And those come out of through studying the architectural patterns and around not just Somerville, but around great cities around the country, and coming up with what, what makes sense for each neighborhood. Now, keep this idea in mind. It's kind of funny that we're actually dealing with Legos tonight, that these are building blocks that go together, and, the, and that they're, uh, you know, they're meant to come together in a pattern that's sympathetic to the existing neighborhoods in Somerville. And there's been a lot of care given to, to, to understanding these types. And so take a look at the new zoning, but also think about how you know, the buildings you see in and around town um, could inform what happens in the future of, of Union Square, not just on these sites, but in the larger neighborhood. Uh, so again, Somerville by Don, just a quick show of hands. How many folks have been to the website and done the survey? OK, so a lot of you haven't. I, I'm, I'm kind of bummed out about that. So please go to the website. The survey is going to close the end of this week. So if you want to get your input in electronically that way, please do it. Um, We'll be launching a different type of survey at the Charette. Uh, so check out the website. And then if you're sharing stuff on social media, just tag it with this, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll be listening. So I'll hand it to Greg now from US2 to, to kick off our meeting. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Greg Karczewski from US2. Can everybody in the back hear me OK? I know it's kind of difficult in this room. Thanks for coming out this evening. Um, we're, uh, we're as, uh, as Russ mentioned, in the fourth session of a series of workshops that we've had in February. And we're really um, excited about tonight's workshop because we're starting to turn the corner and really um, take a lot of the ideas that we've talked about and start to really practically ap apply them to the two sites that, that bookend the T-Station. And um, our agenda for tonight is pretty straightforward. I'm going to give a very brief introduction. And then we're going to talk about program. Um, so what are the mix of uses that we're, we're suggesting might make sense for D2 and D3? And then we're going to introduce some ideas around massing and then have Q&A about, uh, uh, about the discussion. And then uh, we'll have a little uh, exercise, as, as you've probably become aware of, with the, the Legos that are in front of you. So uh, you know, our mission here is to collaborate with the community to create a viable and vital plan for Union Square that really helps realize the vision of summer, or, or the, uh, the ideals of summer vision. Um, Russ really covered schedule, so I'm not going to get into that. Um, cover the, so program, and really program is about the mix of uses. So in you know, real estate parlance, that would be you know, office, hotel, residential, retail. What are the mix of uses that we, we think makes sense for, for D2 and D3? And D2 and D3 are important sites because they're, they're really bookend the T station and they're the gateway um, into Union Square. And so the question that we're posing tonight is, how can the de development of D2 and D3 really achieve the community's goals? And the goals are well documented through the community-based planning process for summer vision over a three-year period, through the revitalization plan, through the RFQ that we participated in, and then really the, the, the series of community meetings that we've had. And uh, it really you know, can kind of boil it down to a several, several key points. One is to create a dynamic mixed-use environment here in Union Square. There's a clear intention to create jobs. Uh, part and parcel to that is really increasing the commercial tax base and then maximizing community benefits from the, the private development. And then everybody's, of course, focused on preserving the great character that's so important to this neighborhood. And lastly, as Russ pointed out, we want to make sure that we can deliver the first phase of the project coincident with the T station. In addition to those qualitative goals, um, there's been more quantitative goals that have been established for Somerville broadly and then Union Square as a neighborhood. And so I'm going to focus on Union Square, but the targets for Union Square as a neighborhood were 1,800 jobs, 600,000 square feet of commercial, um, 525 housing units. It was originally 350. Um, there was, you know, last year there was a report that was issued that suggested that rather than the, the overall community targeting 6,000 units, that it really made sense to target 9,000 units to keep up with um, the demands for housing in the region. Um, and then. In addition to that, 105 affordable housing units and then, and then open space. So you know, these metrics will be how we measure the plan that we start to develop. Um, and so, so how do we start to think about how to achieve those goals? And this is really a framework to start to think about it. And moving left to right, there's a couple of different development scenarios. On the left is a development scenario where we would say, OK, we're going to take D2 and we're going to make it all park. If we were to do that, we'd achieve our open space goal. We'd have a little bit of drain on taxes for the maintenance associated with the park, but we wouldn't have sort of a balanced solution. In the middle is, is, is more of a single use 
So if you look at a single use, maybe retail as an example, you can see we do a decent job of meeting all of our goals. But really the ideal solution is, is a mix of uses that will allow us to really respond to the, the four big goal categories, new jobs, new net taxes, new housing, and new open space. So the program that we'd like to, to talk about and propose tonight is really uh, a program that is very balanced between employment spaces and housing spaces and produces great results. We start to measure this program against the, the metrics that I just talked about. Um, we're able to create a jobs to housing ratio of three to one. So the program would, would contribute about 2,500 jobs to the community and about 840 housing units. These are approximate numbers. The numbers are um, you know, dependent on our, on our collaboration together and kind of the resolution of the final plan. Um, but you can see how um, across all the categories, just on D2 and D3, we do a great job of responding to the goals that have been set for Union Square as a neighborhood. We exceed the job numbers. Um, we meet the, can have the possibility of meeting the commercial space numbers. We exceed the housing on both the affordable and on the market rate housing. And then uh, it would add to the open space inventory here in the city. In addition to that, one of the major goals was to shift the tax base. And preliminary numbers for, for that, the program that we're proposing indicate that we would generate about $3.4 million in annual taxes. And so as a way of sort of sizing that, um, we looked at annual compensation for some of the folks that, that work here in the city. And that would account for 53 public school teachers, or 54 police officers, or 47 firefighters. So it gives you some idea of how the, the impact of the development um, might be felt locally. So, you know, that's, that's the benefits that would come out of the program. So how do we shape the program and how do we arrive at a program that produced those results? And it starts with an objective that you've made very clear, which is how do we create jobs, right? And I think um, as we've gone through the process, um, several folks have, have pointed out the importance of having daytime activity in the square and having a range of job opportunities for folks in Somerville. And so our strategy for uh, creating an employment center here in Union Square is really what drives our approach to defining program for D2 and D3. And as we look at the employment market, I think one of the important data points is what's happening in the employment market. And it's being heavily influenced by the millennial generation. Um, it's 80 million people. In, you know, in the next five years, the millennials are going to become 50% of the workforce. Um, employers across the country are making decisions about where to locate their businesses. Um, based on where they can attract and retain millenn the millennial workforce. So it's a very important driver and a very, very important um, filter for, for how we look at the program that we're going to develop. The other big driver for commercial space is the innovation economy. Historically, um, professional services have, have dr driven office development. Office development is very tied to job creation. Um, in, in the last five years, um, the innovation economy has outpaced general job growth. Um, for example, the high-tech industry outpaced the, the non-tech uh, non industry by a, a ratio of 4 to 1 since 2010. And um, so harnessing the innovation economy as a way of, of, of building a job base here in Union Square is important. Um, what's even more important, I think, is the indirect impacts of the, the, uh, the innovation job that gets created in Union Square. So there was some research done by a um, a nationally acclaimed economist from Cal, uh, University of Cal Berkeley that looked at 32 metropolitan areas, um, I think it's like 11 or 12 million workers, and studied the impact of innovation jobs on the local economy. And what he found was a trend that showed that of every innovation job that was created, it, it created an impact of five additional jobs. And those five additional jobs were split 60% um, to local service jobs and 20% or 40%, excuse me, to, to professional jobs. So. In the, the idea of attracting and, and, and expanding the innovation economy here in, in Union Square um, not only creates new jobs uh, related to the innovation economy, but, but will spur um, additional local employment. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, but we have a very defined strategy around how we would like to create an employment center in Union Square. The first is attracting the, the workers and people that are important to the future of the workforce. The next is environment, create a vibrant mixed-use environment. Um, there was recently a study done by NAOP, which is a, a trade organization, a National Association of uh, Industrial and Office Properties, where they surveyed office uh, employers and asked them about the decisions that they used to, uh, or the criteria that they use in, in locating their business. And they found that 83% of those folks preferred to be in a mixed-use environment 
um, than to be in a single use environment. So the ability to create this vibrant mixed use environment is important to attracting employers. Then the idea of clustering. So there's a, a great innovation culture here in Union Square already. The idea is how do we expand upon that and build upon it. And then space we'll talk about momentarily and then want to leverage the development to create op workforce opportunities throughout Somerville. As part of our employment strategy, we really look closely at the range of, of, of the evolution, really, of innovation companies. From an early stage company that needs to be more nimble, is smaller in size, probably wants more flexible space, all the way to a larger corporate tenant that wants a long-term lease and has, has sort of a more stable program. And our goal here is really to try and create um, places across that, or office spaces or employment spaces across that continuum so a company could really uh, start here in Somerville and then grow here and then stay here for the long term. And so what types of spaces are we talking about? Clearly traditional office, R&D and lab, incubator spaces, um, great examples and you know we've, we've explored the ideas of partnering with Mass Challenge or Cambridge Innovation Center um, or even MIT um, and then co-working space uh, which has you know, become a popular way for the, the amount of job transition that's happening in our economy today, a popular way for, for folks to work. So a key point about our entire office strategy is that, or our employment strategy really, is that in order to launch a large scale office or R&D development, we really need to have pre-leasing. And what that means is we can't go out and build speculatively a very large building. We need to have a lease in hand in order to get lenders to lend us the money to do it. So what that drives is really a very incremental approach to the way we go about moving from where we are today in Somerville into a more mature office and employment market. The first thing is really to prime the bar market. And what we'd like to do is I, or we, we're working on identifying a, a location here in Union Square where we could do some co-working space and get more folks working in Union Square today. Then we want to demonstrate the potential of the market. So on the D2 block, we're proposing to build a couple of floors of spec office building that we would then lease up and, act, and, and demonstrate to everyone that this is a new place for business. And then all the while, we would be working on um, marketing a large scale um, R&D or office facility on the D3 block to try and attract the large tenant that could help us launch that building and create substantial jobs. So I talked about pre-leasing, and uh, you know, an obvious next question would be, how do we attract a tenant to come to Union Square and commit to building an office building here? So how do we improve our chances? Um, this is a quote from a, a, a brokerage firm here in the Boston area that does a lot of work with innovation companies. They have an office here, in, and they have an office in uh, Palo Alto, California. And this quote is, is poignant. It says, companies are seeking access to young people, transportation, arts, culture, cultural density, as well as live, work, and play environments. We definitely have a lot of play in, in the area. We have a certain amount of live in the area. We're trying to attract work, right? And I think um, when you start to think about what employers want, and back to that NAOPS study that I mentioned, employers are interested in mixed-use environments. They're interested in um, options for their employees for housing. They're interested in um, amenity, an amenity base, and sort of a complete amenity-rich environment. As you can see from the picture right here, we're not quite there yet. Um, and so there's some work to be done. And our, our, um, our thought about how to improve that environment and how to create the environment that will help attract employers starts with the idea of new housing. And the, housing's an important element to kickstart the development. Um, you know, first and foremost, there's, you know, there's, a, there's a market for, for housing right now. There's a need for housing in the area. The infusion of additional um, people into the square will create additional vitality. It will also create additional spending power. We did a quick analysis of you know, a development scenario on D2 that includes housing. And it could create six to upwards of $10 million of disposable income that could be spent locally, which would, you know, would, would create a, quite a boost to the local, uh, the local businesses. In addition to that, I think the other thing that's important to think about when we talk about housing as being added to the, the equation uh, in terms of our program is the, the, the ability for housing to create um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the spending power to, to fund community benefits, create infrastructure and improvements on the streetscape, which will help to start create environment here in Union Square. 
And there's been a lot of dialogue uh, throughout our process about housing. Um, and it's ranged from a, an interest in the community to, uh, related to affordable housing, uh, an interest in a range of housing types, an interest in um, some folks saying, hey, it would be great if there was a better mix of housing. I'd love to be able to live and work in prox proximity to each other. And so, you know, what we, would, what we did is started to dive into the market. And this is a, just a summary of the market overview here in Somerville. And I think there's, you know, a couple things that are interesting about this. One is that one and two person households make up 67% of the market. And 67% of the market is, is more rental focused. Um, so as we think about a housing mix and understanding the community's interest in adding a range of housing types as well as uh, affordable housing, you know, our approach is, uh, we, you know, we think that the, uh, the, the family housing units and housing units with uh, more than two bedrooms might have a, a, a stronger place in an affordable building. Um, because what we're finding is that the demand from the market for housing in Union Square is really more oriented towards uh, smaller size units studios, ones, and two bedrooms, targeted at the millennial generation and the boomers. And um, you can see those are the two largest demographics in the, in the country right now. They're driving all the housing decisions. Um, and that, uh, the, both of those generations really make up um, households that are typically um, looking for a smaller profile unit and are more predisposed to renting. So in addition to creating housing to activate the space, um, we need to do some other things to improve environment. One of them is to, to create great public realm and to activate the ground floor space. So we'd like to add open spaces and public spaces. One of the ways to do that is to think about building height. So there's a correlation between building height and the amount of open space. So as you're looking, you know, as we get into the Lego exercise later, um, you'll see that, the, that as you start to stack the Legos up a little higher, that you're going to have more room for public open space or open space. Um, and you know, we're committed to working with the community to try and find the right balance of height and open space for, for both the D2 and D3 blocks. The other, the other way to activate the space is to look at uh, ground floor uses. And we've, you know, throughout the process, we've heard from a lot of you about some of the things that you're interested in seeing on the ground floor. Fresh food, yoga and fitness, um, bookstore, a grocer. Someone here said, I need more places to buy milk, right? So it's not only. Uh, soft goods retail, but it's just services, right? And, and what kind of services would benefit the community? The other, um, the other two services that showed up repeatedly in the surveys that we did are pharmacy and then daycare, actually, another service that pe people are very interested in. So we've really created, um, in addition uh, to the other elements that I talked about, we're going to add retail to the program. And we've created a philosophy around retail that I think uh, responds to our shared values. And one is to amplify and, and enhance the existing value set to look at local operators um, as, a, as a means of, of providing the services that we, we were talking about. Um, and then artisans, innovators, and makers. And then the idea of food as culture, which has been an important part of um, the, you know, the most recent uh, boom of activity here in Union Square. And then last but not least, as we start to think about uses for the properties, um, an, a, a, a great addition to the unit mix or to the, the program mix that we're talking about is to add a hotel. Uh, a hotel has a lot of benefits. Um, it, it creates a great range of jobs, from managerial jobs to sales jobs to back of house jobs to, to service jobs. Um, it's also a great amenity for employers. You know, office employers often look for uh, you know a, a place where either employees or visitors or guests can come and stay. Um, so we think make, adding a hotel to uh, to the program mix makes a lot of sense. So how much of each use should we create? And a, a good starting point for determining use is to look at the 2009 zoning, which was went through a community-based process and approved a certain um, volume, really, of, of development capacity for both sites. And uh, that capacity is a little over 700,000 feet on D2 and a little over 760,000 feet on D3 for a total capacity of almost a million and a half square feet. I think it's also interesting to note that that zoning um, process uh, resulted in um, uh, approval for seven, almost 800 units of housing across D2 and D3. And I think what's important to, to, to note about um, this, this graphic is really the, the land value um, associated with these properties is based on that zoning. So in order for us to develop something that's market feasible, we really need to take advantage of building the program that's available to us on each of these properties. 
And last, but you know, and then we also looked at you know what makes sense from an urban planning standpoint. And as we look at D3 a little bit more closely, we think that there's an opportunity there to, to potentially increase the floor area or to, to add more capacity to D3 um, because of its location. It's in a location next to the T and a, a location that is really the gateway to Boynton Yards, which we think offers a lot of opportunity for larger floor plates that are more um, attractive to an office user. So we're suggesting that that additional density on D3 is something we should explore collectively. And so in the end, here's our a program mix in a little bit more detail. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the program would uh, create 2,500 jobs. It would include you know, up to 600,000 square feet of office or R&D, 150 to 200 room hotel, and then 35,000 to 55,000 square feet of ground floor activated retail spaces. And then on the housing side, split between the two properties, we're looking at 840 to 925 uh, units of housing. So how do we make it happen? Um, it's really gonna happen in two tracks. The, uh, the top line here is, is track A, and I mentioned earlier that our first step is really to get out into the community and identify an existing space in Union Square that we can convert into co-working. And then we would immediately plan on uh, a residential housing program of 500 or 525 units in retail on D2. And then closely follow that with an employment use, which would be a hotel and offices, um, spec office and retail on the north end of D2 where the three is indicated on the drawing. And that location is important to hoteliers because they'd like to be proximate to the plaza, which is obviously a node of activity here in the square. And then in parallel with that, the B track, which is more market driven, um, as I mentioned earlier, in order to launch a significant office building, we need to get a, a tenant to sign a lease ahead of time. We would immediately start marketing an office and R&D building on, you know, the, in the general location of site four on D, D3 proximate to the T station. And then down the line, as the market was able to absorb an additional office building or additional housing, we would look at building out the balance of, of D3. So that's our, our uh, sort of a summary of our program. Rather than jumping into questions, I'm going to turn it over to, to Eric from our design team. He's going to give you a little bit of sense of, about some of the things we've been thinking about around massing. Then we're going to break for questions, and then we'll do the exercise. But I thank you for your time and attention. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out again. I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, we've all been waiting for the moment where we can actually sort of uh, start to imagine how 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 the massing actually um, forms itself on the site. So um, you see the exercise in front of you. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the constraints and opportunities that we find on the site, uh, and a little bit of a primer in terms of how to go about this sort of planning exercise. So. When we talk about massing, um, last time someone said, what is massing? And I said, well, when architects work uh, on buildings, we turn a kind of two-dimensional or a spreadsheet of square footages into three-dimensional form. And that has, that has, um, OK. Uh, so as architects, we turn a, a spreadsheet into a three-dimensional form. And that has impacts on the character of the street. It has impacts on the activities on the street. It has impacts on how the buildings look how they feel, what kind of urban life uh, is produced uh, through this uh, dis distribution of program on the site. So in the last few presentations and different workshops, we talked about public space, we talked about traffic, we talked about brownfields, uh, we talked about the, the, the housing market, the office market, and today we're actually going to try to sort of um, test out those scenarios uh, on these models here. Uh, so how do we start to think about massing? Um, we, we do think of it as a kind of volumetric operation and almost as a piece of sculpture where you can manipulate uh, the, the volume of, of uh, material, of, of programs and uses uh, on the site. So this is a kind of breakdown of the programs that, um, that the team has been working with. This is the mixed use that we think is sort of optimal for this uh, site. Um, if we locate them on the site, we think we need to sort of split them. We have to split them between D2 and D3, where D3 will be closer to Boynton Yards. We'll have connections for larger office floor plates. D2 is connected more intimately to Union Square, and so that suggests different kinds of programs, housing, uh, commercial, and hotel, as, as Greg already pointed out. Um, the other idea that we want to keep in mind is this idea of the gateway, that these two projects shouldn't be understood alone, but they actually should be understood together. 
uh, that together they will frame this new gateway for the T station as it comes in uh, to Union Square. So if we put those volumes down on the site, how do we think about what principles do we want to apply uh, to their distribution, to their design? Um, what uses uh, did you ask for and where should they go? Uh, we've heard a lot of things like we want this here, we want that there, so this is your chance to sort of uh, manipulate the program uh, yourselves as, as teams. You can't do it on your own, you have to work together uh, to do that. Um, so we've heard about the different uses, we've heard about the benefits of mixed use, um, and ultimately, what is the, the benefit to the, to the public realm of these uses? How do we make uh, the streetscape more active? So these are private uses that are sort of creating a kind of urban environment through their sort of public face. Um, we've talked about we don't really want Kendall Square. We want to improve uh, jobs here. We want a different kind of streetscape. But what we heard from you is no Kendall Square, not too corporate. Uh, we heard yes, we like green, we like scale, we like awnings, uh, all kinds of things that we admire about images from these visual preference diagrams. Um, we like cafes, we like street life, we like public art. These are things we heard from you. So how do we carve out shared space here? It's going to be a kind of push and pull between uh, the architecture, the kind of volume, the urban volume of the architecture, and the public realm. And the trade-offs here, and you're going to have a chance to sort of try that out for yourselves. Uh, from the visual preferences survey, uh, we heard lots of people saying we want pedestrian friendly, we want walkable, we want wide sidewalks. Um, we heard a lot about shifting away from parking towards parks. Uh, examples like this, a lot of positive responses to these kinds of images. Um, for the D3 uh, parcel, we're gonna talk about D3 first. Um, there's a concern that it might turn into a mega block. Uh, it's, a, it's a big chunk. And so how do you break that down? How do you break it down to bring light in, to bring people through? And so it doesn't feel like a precinct, but it feels like it's something porous that people could walk through, like a piece of the city that you would sort of, you would wander through there. You might take a shortcut through there. There's a lot of talk about we get an extra bridge there across the railroad tracks. Um, so how does office and R&D occupy the D3 site? Um, office buildings tend to be big and bulky, um, especially the R&D ones, the lab buildings. This is an example from Kendall Square, uh, the Koch Center at MIT. It's extremely uh, bulky. Um, and it has this, this kind of presence on the streetscape. Um, there are other examples, sort of mid-scale, um, different types of expressions. Uh, but fundamentally, an office floor plate is, is wider and deeper than a housing floor plate. Office space, what we like about it, is the daytime use. It brings people to work there. At lunchtime, they come outside. They have lunch outside. And that's what activates the city in the daytime. So these are not so much designs as sort of showing how much volume of office space, the blue uh, chunks, would occupy on the D3 parcel. Uh, and as you start to manipulate it yourself, you'll find out which are the configurations that work. Obviously, you have to keep in mind um, the scale of these things, how to get light in. There's all kinds of complexities uh, to starting to um, distribute this program on the site. The other part is residential. The D3 parcel will have a, a significant piece of residential on it as well. How does office interact with residential? Should they be stacked on top of each other? Should they be adjacent to each other? What's the synergy of uses between these two building types? These are types of uses that are typical in mixed-use cities that we admire. So um, ultimately, their expressions will be much more articulated. It's not an architectural presentation. It's really a kind of example of how to distribute massing on the site and what kind of public realm it'll produce, what kind of cut-throughs, what kind of plazas, what kind of light will come through, um, and ultimately, it will result in an architectural design that will have some sort of articulation that will break it down into something that's, that's human scale. So the D2 principles are very similar. Uh, we ask what kind of uses will go there. As Greg said, there will be more, there'll be a hotel use, there'll be some office use, there'll be more retail use along the street. We've talked about how to activate that street, Prospect Street. Um, so how do we make Prospect Street more active? Uh, in the past, we've talked about street frontage. And we don't want a, con a continuous linear street front. We want to break it up into smaller pieces, things that will create a sense of scale, a sense of rhythm, a sense of interest as you walk down the street. Uh, so how do we carve shared space out of, out of the development uh, parcel? We've heard a lot from the visual preferences. People like the different textures, the different colors, the different plantings, the different types of streets, furniture. Um, we heard about uh, different kinds of open space. Uh, different kinds of plantings and different kind of lighting. And even a park like this, which is extremely narrow, is still a great way to sort of activate a kind of urban edge. 
uh, with hardscape and softscape and activities uh, for people to do. So how do we shape D2? Um, looking at housing, uh, one thing you recognize immediately in terms of how this is Paris, housing tends to be a kind of bar. It's not a kind of block as much as an office building. Housing tends to be narrow. It needs light on both sides for bedrooms. If you look at Paris, if you look at South Boston, 65 feet is the kind of typical dimension for a double loaded corridor. So that's something to keep in mind as you start to manipulate the blocks. You can't sort of jam them all together and say that's housing. Housing requires daylight, it requires outdoor space, uh, and so on. Um, and even looking around Somerville, townhomes and apartments, 55 to 75 feet of width. So that's something to keep in mind. How does office, hotel, and housing occupy the D2 site? Um, office, like I said, will sort of bring daytime activities, uh, and those we imagine, and you can think about this, would probably make sense closer to the, to the square, uh, where there's already activity happening. Um, office is a range of different types of things. Uh, there's incubator spaces, uh, there's R&D spaces. So as you think about where should the office go, we'd suggest thinking about it near the square. Um, Hotel, another use we talked about, where does that want to be? It might also be near the square, sort of uh, marking the corner there along Union Square. Um, on the other corner, against the T, we thought that would be more appropriate for housing. That's where you could put some high density housing right close to the T. Uh, we talk about transit oriented development. Where does the density go? It goes closest to uh, the, the transit. So in this diagram, we've shown sort of suggested that you could mark both corners with, with some uh, higher uh, uh, buildings and have uh, other types of programs uh, in between. So how does it start to take shape? You take the site, you sort of fill it up, uh, you push it back. There is actually a setback from the MBTA here. There's a setback from the residential, and we're setting back from the sidewalk to create more of a kind of urban uh, plaza along the walkway there. Um, we could imagine carving it out You'll have a chance to do this sort of displacing program, moving it around, uh, and redistributing it. Where does it go? Could it be uh, on the two corners? And then as you sort of carve out the space, it introduces natural light, it produces public spaces. So this is not a design, it's just a suggestion of how the kind of give and take uh, of the volume that you're sort of manipulating will start to uh, displace itself uh, on the site. At the end of the day, we do think, in principle, it's uh, makes sense to have greater height around the T. This is a section, so there's the subway line. Uh, there's Union Square on the left and Boynton Yards on the right. We think this kind of uh, slope uh, towards the T station makes sense in terms of defining that gateway. Um, and the thing that we love about Union Square is that it's an outdoor room. When you're in the square, you're defined by the edges of the buildings and the trees and the activities of that room. And so that, that scale, that intimacy, is something we want to preserve. Um, so from Union Square, we want to make sure that, that that sense of spatial definition is intact. One of the diagrams we did is, well, here's Union Square. Maybe if there's height, it should be further away. It should be towards the T. Maybe not exactly on, on Union Square itself. And so just one representation of a building at Union Square from, at the T from Union Square, you might see it as a kind of landmark. You might say, oh, there's a T. That's where I need to go. So it becomes a kind of wayfinding device well, I've got to go here, and then I've got to find my way over to the T. Um, if we look, if we zoom out, and we look at the landscape of Cambridge and Somerville, we notice high-rise buildings at Kendall Square, uh, at Central Square, at Harvard, uh, even at Inman Square. You know, buildings of greater density mark these kind of urban nodes. Uh, and so we think it might be appropriate to have the higher buildings at the T station bracketing that T as a kind of gateway. And, Ultimately, we want to sort of see it relative to other buildings in, in Somerville and ultimately relative to the Prospect Hill uh, Monument. And just as an exercise, we sort of compared buildings in Boston. How tall is the Hancock Building? 791. How tall is Trinity Church? Uh, 211. Uh, in principle, we want to say that it should, it should fit in uh, and it should concentrate height. If you had to have height, put it by the T. That makes the most sense. Um, how does it all come together? So um, we did this quick little uh, sort of an animation showing how you would take the program and sort of pull it up. And how do you think about it as a constant volume? So you're starting to manipulate it. Uh, how are you shaping it? You're bending it, you're forming it, you're pushing it up and down. 
Uh, and this is how we start to, as architects, uh, manipulate volume. Um, on D2, you might take the same amount of uh, area, volume. You would sort of push it around, say, well, I want height near the T. Uh, well, that's too high, I'm gonna turn it. Um, I'm gonna spread it out. Um, I'm gonna push it down, uh, push it together, uh, squeeze it. Uh, oops, too long. Uh, then I'm gonna wrap it around. And this is a strategy for saying every housing unit gets light. It produces public space. Uh, and so this is not a design as much as a kind of a visualization of how you might manipulate programs on a site. Uh, so together, it sort of makes this kind of slope, this kind of gateway right here uh, that sort of uh, marks the entrance to Somerville. Okay, so that was a quick presentation of the kind of rules of the, of the, of the game. You have to sort of um, recognize the different program types and what their uh, dimensional, proportional um, standards are. Um, we've tried to simplify it into different uh, Lego blocks. So you'll have housing blocks in front of you. Uh, you have 45 of those. You've got retail blocks uh, and office blocks. So this is a D3 uh, program. Let me, I've, I've got one more slide, then you can ask questions. So uh, the D2 program, similar. There's housing, retail, hotel, and office. Um, and there's, there's rules. So like I said, Office, yes, it can be wide, it can be tall. Housing, it tends to be narrow. So as you manipulate it, think about daylight, getting daylight into those units. Uh, that's too deep for housing, okay? Hotel, good, retail, yes. Retail doesn't stack very well. So those are very simple rules uh, of the game. The other piece that I should tell you is there's a piece of, of, of foam core. This represents parking. We do need parking, we haven't talked about it too much. It will be a large floor plate, hopefully uh, efficiently planned, that will occupy a large part of the site. Uh, even though it's transit-oriented development, we do have to plan for some parking. So keep that in mind as you move the Legos around. Where do you take that? You might take it, fold it in half, for example. Um, but we'd like to give you an opportunity to uh, manipulate the Legos. But first, maybe questions. Okay, you want to do the questions now for the exercise? Okay. We can do some questions and then we'll get into the exercise if that works for everybody. Yes, sir. It's a good question. It's Yeah, I think it's a it's a good idea. It's something we should look at. I mean I think it initially it's something that we'll have to look at the cost of because the cost of that would be, you know, something that would merit some consideration. I think the other thing that's, that's been talked about is the idea of somewhere around Allen Street there being more of an accurate pedestrian crossing over the tracks. I think that's another way to connect the two parcels, but it's a, it's a good comment. Uh, we, uh, we are, for the initial phase of the development, we're thinking about a rental program only. Um, we think as the, the project matures a little bit, there, there could be an opportunity to add for sale housing into the mix, but initially the market for rental is kind of where the market is right now. And we'd be looking at a, a, a range of unit types. We haven't really pinned down kind of what the, you know, what the sizes of those units are. But as I mentioned earlier, it'd likely be you know, studios ones and twos, because that's really where the depth of the market is. So studios ones and twos are good for the current situation. When those millennials get married and have kids, how do we keep them? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, we we've heard you know 
loud and clear that the community would like to see more family housing. We'd like to explore the opportunity to, to investigate how we might be able to provide the housing. Um, the reality is, is the, the market right now for housing is being driven by those two populations that I mentioned earlier, the boomers and the millennials. And it's, it's a generation that's going to take a while to sort of process through the market. So I think there will, there will be a, a use for those units in Union Square for a really long time. We're going to have a, a, a meeting during the Surratt about housing to talk, think about that that issue at the neighborhood scale. So I would you know, make sure to turn that up here. Just to... Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. I mean, we're uh, <laughs> thanks for the question. You know, we're committed to providing affordable housing. I know that you know the, the, the mix of affordable housing in the market is something that's going to be part of the community dialogue as we move forward through the planning process. Um, you know, in terms of height, I think you know Eric made a presentation about uh, the importance of a variety of, of scales, if you will, in the square. We think that there's a lot of value to that and. As I mentioned earlier, you know, adding new housing to the square has a lot of benefits in terms of, you know, producing more vitality, producing more uh, disposable income that could be spent in the square, um, and really sort of kickstarting the development. I mean, there's a window of opportunity here right now where the market is very strong, and there's an opportunity to uh, to, 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 to add some vitality to the square that'll really kind of get things moving. Yes, sir. Hi, um, my name is Chris Corda, summer of development watch. I just want to point out that this process definitely does not represent the views that I expressed at the last US2 planning meeting, that there's a point of view about all this that's being overlooked. It could be summarized like this. If you're starting from the premise always that we have to add 9,000 units of housing, you're going to get certain answers. But actually, there's plenty of people who disagree with you about that and say that that's not how Kendall Square, the Kendall Square miracle was established. They didn't do it by building a lot of luxury retail, uh, luxury condo towers with luxury retail on the first floor and then trying to attract corporations. They actually had the vision and the patience to attract the big corporations first. And so my, my concern is that basically, to, not to be, to put it to be rude, but at some level, circles are got, about to get hustled. We're going to give away some of our prime real estate to the luxury condo industry. We don't get it back. And that real estate is built over and basically we lose that. And then maybe later, yeah, maybe later we can sell some, 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 some scraps of land to corporations and try and get them to build towers for them. But we're starting from the wrong premise. Maybe we actually have to attract the corporate clients first if that's what we want. Because otherwise, we will wind up with not just the emotion of tax expansion. So yeah, that view should be more recognized. It was expressed in the last meeting. Appreciate the view, and I think we... Uh... Yeah, I think um, the suggestion was maybe we'll take one more question and then we'll move into the exercise and we can have uh, more more dialogue at the tables and then we can do some more questions afterwards. But, you know, appreciate your viewpoint. I mean, I think that we're, you know, there's a set of goals that have been, that have been set up um, for... Pardon? We set, we set the 9,000-minute goal. Before the Alderman did, the, the steering committee for the, the summer vision did not. It came from only one person. And you presented it as our goals. That's right. That's the issue. It's not our goals. I, you know, I, uh, I appreciate your viewpoint. I don't really know how to respond. I mean, I, I think what we're what we're trying to do is is understand the goals of the community. You know, understanding that there's a, a need for more housing in the region. 
you know it sounds like there needs to be more community debate about the importance of adding housing you know i think that as this development was looked at the in the zoning there was a community based process back in two thousand and nine there was a mix of uses and a mix of uses is a very important i think sir to your point to attract an office tenant we need that you know we need more than what we have right now in union square and the t is not enough that's 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 not my view solely that's a view you know of a number of folks that have spent you know a lot of time in the in the office market trying to attract office tenants to environments it's a pioneering location it requires some pre-leasing in order to pre-lease we need to to have something to demonstrate to an employer that this is a place that they want to be so just in case folks are feeling like some of this question and answer has passed them by let me provide a quick piece of context about the summer vision comprehensive planning process between 2009 and 2012 for the first time our city engaged in a participatory and long-range planning process summer vision is a comprehensive plan and recognized under massachusetts general law legally adopted by the city's planning board and formally endorsed by the city's board of aldermen it's a best practice for municipal governments all over the country now when the volunteers who served on the summer vision steering committee uh, had been working tirelessly for three straight years literally meeting monthly for 36 months and i see many folks in the room tonight who had participated in that process one of the things that they challenged our staff to do was to set quantitative measurable targets for the things that are important to our community new open space new jobs transportation decisions and mobility choice as well as housing units right um, and so we worked through uh, what our volunteers viewed as an equitable and balanced process back in 2011 2012 uh, and came up with the 125 acres of open space target the 6,000 housing units target the 30,000 jobs target those numbers uh, were run through some you know back of the envelope finance calculations that talked about a net benefit net positive benefit to municipal finance uh, that talked about creating 18 to 24 hour neighborhoods where people had the choice to live work play close uh, within uh, a walking distance um, and they were viewed as, as something that a lot of folks uh, believe strongly in so the 9,000 housing unit number that folks have raised uh, came out of a technical study by the regional council of governments that serves hundred cities and towns in greater Boston who did some technical work last year and said as we all know we're in the midst of a regional housing crisis how could we write regional supply and demand they had recommended from a technical standpoint uh, a 9,000 number target that is just a target that is just coming out of a technical study um, municipal comprehensive plans need to be updated every five years that's also a municipal best practice right so the comprehensive plan was adopted back in 2012 and we would certainly expect another community-based participatory process to make sure uh, that the findings and recommendations are relevant and timely going forward so uh, we expect that in the next couple of years 9,000 is just a recommendation thanks That might be a good break to, to work on the exercise, and then we'll take some questions afterwards. So this is where I come in to facilitate. This is really important for us to understand. So, well, so to address the mix about housing, that's a neighborhood scale issue that we need to discuss at the charrette. You know, Boyne Yards is going to be a substantial contributor to that process. You know, if Kendall Square is the model or the conversation we want to have right now, then it's not specific to the D2, D3 parcels. So that's a, a, a conversation I want to have during the charrette. So it, it, that, that's what I recommend we do now is, is sort of take this next step into this exercise and come back to the conversation about how do we substantially increase office space. And it's going to involve a much larger parcel of land and area of land in that discussion. Yeah, I think that's. So Anna suggested that if you are not content with the mix, take pieces off the table or add pieces onto the table. So this is we want to get an input from from you all about the program that's suggested tonight. And how that needs to fit on the site. So, if, if that that would be a, that's the suggestion we should make. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm seeing hands. How's your supply of green blocks? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, 
the reality is, is we'd love to build a, as much office as we could create in Union Square, and it, it's going to it's going to be a matter of, you know, how how quickly we can attract tenants to Union Square. So it, it's going to be it's a market driven process. I mean, that, that, you know, it's not it's not about how many green blocks I think should be there or not be there. It's just going to be a matter of how quickly the market can absorb. It. I, mean, I would just say I, mean, I really I thought the architectural presentation was incredibly useful, very helpful. Um, I think there is a going. So, I really, you know, this is a chaotic process, so I think people should get started and we'll still take questions. So everyone can win here. So if you want to get started and you have ideas about how you want to distribute program, take program away. If you want to add program, you know, redistribute it, go ahead. If you have burning questions, let's keep doing that. But if we could just respect the fact that some people might want to get started, and then we'll come back to that, you know, Come back to the the table discussion in 20 minutes. So, please don't uh, please don't uh, sit there and not do anything if you want to get started. So I see a hand here. Why don't we take another question? I heard was that you wanted to put the residential near the T-stop and to keep the office away from the T-stop. I'd like to point out that many, many people go to office jobs on the T and it would that would actually be a draw in my opinion. Second thing is you shouldn't exclude putting residential on top of office or vice versa. That's done in many places. Uh, third thing is that Office workers, employers have a tendency now to put things away from amenities because they want their employees to concentrate. So I think that the put, expecting that putting amenities in first is going to attract corporations is putting the is doing it backwards. Thank you. Okay. So there's two comments here. These aren't questions. So the comment about affordable housing, family workforce housing. We're going to address that during the housing uh, meeting at the Charette. The city is very interested. We just had a meeting about it this afternoon about what's the policy, how can we develop policy around that, and how can the, uh, the affordable house, housing advocates and the city's housing department align and try and figure out how to do that. So we're going to, we want to talk about that more during the Charette and start to think about next steps for that, short term and long term. How we attract office is a conversation we need to talk about at a district level around Boyne Yards. So we're, there's a meeting during the threat. We're going to talk about that as well to make sure there's a good strategy about that. There's definitely market dynamics. And I go back to what's the community's goals around how you, when you get out of the train station, do you want to be walking through a construction site or do you want to have a finished block coming down to the square? And that's a big decision point. Our assumption right now, the city's assumption right now, is that people want to have a finished project that they can walk out of the train station with and walk into the square rather than a construction site or, a, or an empty lot waiting for office space. So I think we need to talk about that in, the, in addition to how do we deliver office.
the way to build that office building is to attract the tenant. And so we're, we're dependent on a commitment from a tenant to build the building. Um, you know, we can't build a sizable building speculatively up against the T. Um, you know, I think that's driving part of the decision making. Yes, sir. Thank you for the feedback. I mean, I think that we're, you know, first of all, the plan that we outlay, uh, outlined was is balanced. It, it meets jobs objectives. It includes office uses right against the T in Boynton Yards, which would be the gateway to the area of, of Union Square that can really support a lot, a lot more larger footprints, which are required for office and, and R and D uses. We think, and we think we've outlined a, a, a very logical plan to get to the goals of the community around jobs, and, you know. We, it, unfortunately, we can't build a large spec office building and, and, you know, and hope that it gets filled up. We need to take a rational approach to attracting employers to the square. Just a general comment about the charrette. So there's been some suggestions here about office first, all that. What happens if we don't, if, if we don't build anything first because the office can't come out of the ground because it's not feasible in the short term? So. If you have ideas specific like that that you're not seeing yet, we want to know about them because we're going to draw them during the charrette. So that's part of the process that we sort of instituted during the by design uh, planning exercise we've been doing around the city is that if you have an idea and you want to see what it looks like, we're going to draw it. So two questions I've been asking about this is, you know, what happens to when you come out of the T station if nothing's built? What does it look like? And then you've raised a good question about what happens if it's office? Now, if that's the by design, is that what the community is asking for by design, and that's what they want, then we have to figure out, okay, how is it feasible, and what's the, and what's the decisions that need to be made to make it feasible. So if you have ideas that you want to see that you're not getting shown tonight, please let us know, and you'll see them at the charrette. So I'd suggest that, you know, that this is a step in the process. So I'm sensing some, you know, you know some, some concerns. That's fine to have concerns right now because we want to address those and draw them in, during the charrette. So that's the kind of feedback we need to hear as well. All right, so no more questions. Everyone get to work.
Uh, let's uh, quiet, up, quiet up everyone so we can hear some feedback. So, so we developed a scheme which tries to step in and out at the streetscape so that you get a little bit of opportunity for green space and plaza space along the streetscape, but also some uh, light shafts, some areas for view through from the street. So you, because a lot of these blocks are very deep, um, we're prioritizing office and retail at the perimeter, and then housing is a little bit more tucked in, and there are some opportunities to break up the mass of the office buildings in particular. And, you know, having having different occupancies at different times of day, right? If you've got retail that's, that's occupied probably most of the day, but you've got office space that's probably only occupied during the workday and then is empty, you don't want those big blocks to be dead. So we tried to mix in the housing and the retail and create views through to the center of the place, um, public gathering. He stopped and we hotel over retail near Somerville Avenue, near Union Square and other places. We've had interior parks and off the tee, we have a triangular park that you can, you just walk into from the tee. We have a park between buildings and we have a pedestrian way over the, uh, over the, um, rails and we kept um, a certain portion of the residential out of play because we don't believe that we need 9,000 residential units thank you okay great um, how about this table here you guys ready so we like the idea of seeing the T some high-rise over the T from the from the square so we kept it lower on the square side and high at the at the at the T. Uh, thought very important that the uh, the gateway, the, the leading that 600 feet to Union Square from the T, not be an unbroken block, but to have cut throughs uh, where you build over it, so you have that valuable um, real estate. But cut throughs that can have courtyards behind and housing and plazas all behind, all leading from and a, a, a back way to lead up to the T. And then, very important, built over the T. That's valuable real estate that can um, allow us to have more open space and build over the T and use that space there. Super, thank you. Just everyone, don't move your blocks. We're gonna photograph these before everyone's done. All right, so, uh, how about this table back here? You folks ready? Anne? Uh, you guys are still building. All right. Philip, you're still building too. <laughs> yeah. All right, so how about, let's, does anyone have any questions while these folks are still building? We had a lot of questions before, no more questions? So, uh, do you want, Eric, could you explain the, the assumptions around parking right now? Okay, so uh, you all have a piece of foam core that represents parking. Um, and we know certain uses do require parking, even though it's a train station, and we expect a lot of people to take the train, transit-oriented development. So, we expect the demand for parking to go down over time. That's a trend nationally. Uh, Bill, Bill knows this. Uh, he's been working on this topic. So. Uh, if uses require parking, the market will say, well, let's provide parking. But how do we think about parking in a way that might uh, recede over time? How can we think about a parking structure that might transform into retail space in the future? I think that's the cutting edge of thinking about parking is how do we use technology? How do we plan for future cultural shifts, uh, removing parking requirements? Um, and how do we keep our plan flexible? Still, still accommodate those abilities. This hotel. <laughs> <laughs> 
the difficulty with the uh, Duplo is th that it's a little chunky, um, and so we're we're not quite fully made. We actually didn't agree, so I I invented something very quickly to satisfy Eric. Um, and uh, one of the things we'd really like to see, I would really like to see explored. Maybe other people talked about is the idea of mixing uses in the tower. The tower being maybe bigger for the first six floors and being R&D space with retail at the bottom, of course, and then a narrower residential above. Um, a little more elegant than the Duplo allows, probably. Um, so, um, and, and going tall. I, I, I like the idea of a skinny, tall tower. And I have to say that I'm probably the person in this room more than anybody else who will be affected by this view. So, um, so this is not, this is an anti-NIMBY position. Um, um, I think, so that, I think it's very interesting to explore the idea of a mix of uses within a building, within towers, particularly because you can do some cross subsidies in the financing maybe when you do that. Um, we did a lot of this when we were working in Portland, Oregon, where we were actually financing the bottom half of a building with the top half of a building um, through uh, tax increment financing. Uh, so that was interesting. The other thing I'd love to see is um, a lot of permeability um, and to break up the buildings as much as possible. The, the plinth suggestion for parking makes that harder to do as much as one might like. And I don't like the plinth and you're elevating the whole structure um, 15 feet above whatever the grade would be, at least at the bottom of the site. And I, I'd like it to be more level. And to keep the parking separate, because I think you have much more flexibility for accommodating the future of parking as it evolves into a very different set of needs. And so, but we honestly didn't get as far as we liked. We, we had a very interesting group of people who wanted to talk about everything except Lego. Or what about this last table? Who would like to share some thoughts? So um, we somehow just figured out how to get some more office in this area over here. So we have like a big office area close to the T and, and kind of straddling a little bit to the, the T. So, you know, there's easy access. And, um, we put a little for... Um, some of the conventions and the exhibitions that kind of, you know, like the idea of this kind of um, edge that's, that's presented. We have a, a scale, and then we open this block a little bit. This is um, because there's not really that good of access. So we were thinking maybe we actually have some low rise like townhouses back there, and there's sort of opening that up into more of a kind of park space, but then there's some of the, the, the housing this way in there. I think that's... Well, we moved a lot of housing off the site, and we um, traded our housing away to someone else who wanted more housing. And we <laughs> traded it for more green blocks. All right, well, thanks, everyone. So is there another another table over here? You guys want to? Uh, no? OK. All right, well, is there anyone else who has some of the table they don't know? We've covered everyone? Oh, OK. This is part two. There was one more point that we wanted to make, or I wanted to make, about public space. Um, the station. Often stations are very kind of dead things, and uh, if you actually go to Assembly Row, Assembly Square, and you think, try to think, how does the station integrate with that whole place? And the answer is, it doesn't. Um, so we don't want to make that mistake. And, uh, and the whole purpose of this, or a big purpose of this exercise of doing the D2 block early is to integrate it with the station. And we haven't really thought about that enough. I think we need public space right next to the station, because Unispair is becoming a mobility hub, a multimodal mobility hub. And to do that, we need public spaces 
very close to the station, to make the station part of Union Square, rather than block tower of Union Square, which pulling the buildings back enough to create a wedge of space. Wedges of space work really well. Um, Union Square works well because it's a wedge-shaped space. It's this odd, funny triangle of space that creates all these weird activities that we love. We can repeat that geometry, I think, next to the station in interesting ways. But to do that space next to Prospect, with an interesting transition from Prospect down to it, because you've got to, to create the public space financially, you've got to, you've got to get more square footage going up. And I, I, don't, I actually like that. I like the hype. All right, so thank you everyone for, uh, for hanging in, us, in with us here tonight. Um, a lot of really fascinating ideas here. So um, I had a conversation with a group over here while, during the activity, and I want to just reiterate a few points that came up. So there should, we have more questions right now than we have answers. I just want everyone to let, let everyone know that. That's what the charrette is for, is to start to try and answer a lot of those questions. So make sure you've got your, that marked on your calendar and you, and you come if there's additional you want to dive in deeper on items and really talk about some of the, the hot buttons. Uh, there are, those meetings are really important that you come and we start to really have you know, sort of the, the deep discussions on those topics that we need to. Um, so mark your calendar, show up to the charrette, and then we're going to stick around. So if you have other questions you want to talk about, uh, we'll, we're happy to do that tonight. But I just wanted to thank everyone again. And, uh, and don't touch your blocks. We're going to photograph them. So see you on uh, March 9th right here. We'll be there for those three days. Thanks, everyone.